So the brands that are going to be succeeding in 2023 are using social media now for engagement rather than audience building. Hello, Proverbs, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders. I'm so excited. We have a very special guest with us today. Her name is Miriam Schumann. And Miriam is an artist, and she's also the founder of The Inspiration Place, where she helps other artists learn how to profit from their passion or become better artists. And she has helped thousands of artists around the world develop their skill sets and create more time and freedom to do what they love. Her art and story have been featured in major publications such as Forbes, New York Times, Art of Man, Art Journaling Magazine, What Women Create, as well as featured on NBC's Parenthood and the Amazon series Hunters with Al Pacino. She wins forthcoming book that she's written under the HarperCollins brand is called Artpreneur, which is scheduled to be released January 31st of 2023. Her podcast, The Inspiration Place, is in the top 1% of all podcasts and is listened to in over 100 countries. So please join me in welcoming Miriam Schumann to our platform. Hey, Miriam, how are you doing today? Good. Thanks for inviting me. I'm so excited to be here. Well, we are very, very excited to have you here. And today we've got a plethora of topics, actually. You know, even though it's primarily geared to our artists, I think in some way, a lot of us entrepreneurs are artists, right? This is our art, the craft that we've chosen. But um, we've got quite a few conversations that I think are going to be relevant to every industry, really. And so the first thing that I wanted to talk about is what are some of the trends that you are seeing right now in this new era economically? This kind of pandemic, kind of coming out of pandemic. I'm not sure where we're in, but what are you seeing in terms of trends? Okay. So this is not just trends that apply to painting. This is trends that apply to everything. So what I like to say I do is I take all the business knowledge and skills that we all need. And I translate that for my artists who, you know, don't understand how it applies to them. So what we're going to focus on, on your audience today, and so I'll try to not always give art examples, but one of the biggest things that happened during the last three years during the pandemic is, of course, we all went online and Amazon outpaced Walmart and unseated Walmart as the top seller. So what that has done is consumers are now used to very easy click to purchase transactions. and this, if you already have an e-commerce, you know, that pretty much hasn't changed for you. If you are selling an information product, buyers are looking for more transparency and less friction in that process, not these complicated funnels. They want to know right away, how much does it cost? What is it? And how do I get it? So knowing that this psychology has changed, that they just want to know, they want transparency. That's a big shift that has happened. Oh, yeah, definitely. You know, um, we just want to click here right now (laughs) and do PayPal, right? Or even what Apple Pay (laughs) is what we want to see. That is very interesting. So make it easy for your buyer, make it frictionless with that. And don't hide the prices. I mean, this is this is something that's been true both in the art world. You know, you have to like call the gallerists and find out or, you know, like only to the trade, we will tell you what the price is. And a lot of that has changed because people don't like it. They want to know how much it costs right away, whether they're a B2B business and they're doing business with you. They want to know. They don't want to have to jump through all kinds of hoops to find out. I love that. You know, I sat in through a presentation the other day and, you know, they were talking about how great they were and what they could do. And at the end, they invited us for a call, but never put the price out there. I'm like, I don't know if I should be calling, you know, maybe I'm not qualified to call. (laughs) That's right. That's right. So like, put it all out there. Don't let make people guess, you know, either they're going to say no to you ahead of time because they might have in their mind that it's something they don't want you know, they'll say no to the call. So you're putting up an an extra obstacle for them. Another big change that happened was in 2020, because of the social justice movement, people are much more aware of shopping with their values. Now, this is the conscious consumer. And the research shows that this group of people, most of them have household incomes of over six figures. So these, this is the market you want to reach, and they are shopping with their values. 
And this group of consumers, they have different values. So there are some who will look to see if you have ethical practices. There will some that might be care about sustainability. There are others who would prefer to shop with a woman-owned business or a black-owned business. So people are looking a lot more at these things. I know my own behavior has changed that if a catalog comes and it's all white people, it goes straight in the garbage because... I'm conscious of this now in a way that I wasn't pre-2020. So there's always been conscious consumers, but this group has definitely grown and it is an affluent group that is shopping with their values. And I, I need to add that it's not your fake values. So it's not like, oh, it's you know gay pride week and now we're going to talk about that. They can see right through it. So it's something that needs to be Throughout your marketing copy, there is an inclusiveness if you want to reach these consumers. Very interesting. So really, um, not just having your values, but really showing them throughout your marketing, really, like your through your pictures, right? Through, I guess, the people, you know, for us, you know, your conversations, who you're having conversations with, you know, and just really making that a, a point. You know, I, I think one of the things that we've seen a big rise of is the B Corp out there, you know, the the do good for the employees, do good for the world and do good for nature type of businesses out there. So definitely people are aware of the things, the imprint that they want to leave in the world. And so, you know, we want to make sure that we are attracting those people that really would value the things that we do. Yeah. So what I did inside my book, Artpreneur, is in the chapter, Think Like an Abundant Artist, there are 14 lessons. And throughout there, I wove in metaphors using women's underwear. Like, what's the difference between somebody who pays $1.49 for a pair of underwear, a 10 pack from Walmart, versus somebody who's going to pay $10 $10 at Victoria's Secrets versus somebody who's going to pay $30 for Notori, maybe because they care. It's a woman owned brand. It's a Filipino woman who was left finance. So, you know, her founder story makes a difference and it makes a connection point with consumer. And then it's all the way up to $400 for maybe Dolce and Gabbana. But if you don't like their practices, then you might be looking for a different brand. So, for example, Pia was one of the more inclusive brands that I saw that offers very high end lingerie for women and people obviously are paying these prices because that's what's, you know, all over the website, $400 thongs. And wow, that's interesting. Oh my goodness. Um, (laughs) I don't think I've joined the 400 thong yet. Um, No, but (laughs) you know, there's something about that aspiration and that's something that really is important for artists to understand, but not just artists, for all business owners to understand is that when you have a high-end product and it becomes aspirational, people enjoy spending money on it. So it's, I think economists call it like a Veblen. A Veblen good is a good that people um, desire because it's expensive. So electric cars would be an example of that. You know, something that has that appeal and, you know, a Chanel bag maybe for women because people know that you had to spend a lot of money to have it. Oh, yeah. What else are you seeing out there? Okay. So so this is not something that's new, but this is something a lot of people don't think about. So when I first started selling way back when online, the only thing we had was eBay. There was no Facebook. There was no Instagram. Maybe we had MySpace. I don't know. So uh, back in those days, I was selling my art on eBay. And I remember eBay telling us that we would make more sales if we priced things to the penny. But that's because the people shopping on eBay are penny pinchers. Now, you'll notice that Walmart, like I said, a 10-pack of, of Hanes is $14.97. And that's because Walmart knows that the people who shop there are counting every penny. Now, you're going to attract clients who are counting every penny if you price that way. So that's charm pricing. Charm pricing is when you end your your numbers in a 97 or 99 because you want them to perceive it as under $15 rather, you know, $14 rather than $15, or you price it at $4.97 because you want them to think about it as in the 400s. And so that does work from some industries in some cases. However, rounded prices, so ending in zero, zero, there is 
a case to be made for that. So let's talk about it. So charm pricing is when you end a 97 or 99. Prestige pricing is when you use a rounded number. Now here's what the research shows. It's so interesting, Suzanne. So they looked at champagne and champagne, when it was priced at $40, 40.00 sold better than when it was priced at $39.99 or $41 and whatever. And why is that? Because when you price past the decimal point or you have that charm pricing for $497, that is processed by the logical side of your brain. When you round your prices, it is processed by the emotional side of your brain. So which side of your brain do you want your customers using when they are deciding whether or not to invest in your product? And that will inform your decision about whether to use charm pricing or prestige pricing. That is very interesting that you say that, Miriam, you know, because you see a couple of times a year, I go to New York City, there's um, a couple of meetings that I have there. And um, one of the hotels that I used to love staying at, and I, and I wish that it was still open and closed during the pandemic was their Crown Plaza on Times Square. And it has this little restaurant, you know, and <laughs> this is Crown Plaza, but they got the best chicken wings. Okay, guys, the best chicken wings. And I remember looking through their menu and I was like, there's no sense here. There's no sense on this menu. It's like all around, no sense. But you're right. You know, there are certain consumers that are used to looking at a different route. And I'm staying at the Crown Plaza because one, I love looking out at the middle of Times Square. There's the hot ticks right across the street, right? They don't have to like walk 10 blocks to get to. It's just convenient. You know, I can go see a play, come back to my hotel and I don't have to worry about a cab. And I'm there for the experience. So you're absolutely right. I am there at the Crown Plaza sitting gear, getting these amazing chicken wings. And I'm not interested in any sense. So you're absolutely right. It's an emotional decision. And uh, that also brings us to one of my other lessons. So lesson number 11. So I told you there's 14 lessons. Lesson number 11. Uh, I'm willing to bet that on the menu, not only was it rounded, but there wasn't a currency symbol. You're probably right. There probably wasn't. If you go into a high-end restaurant, you will not see a currency symbol. And that, you know, that depends whether you're where, you know, if it's a pound symbol or a dollar symbol or shekels or whatever. So the, the research has shown that people will spend more when you leave the currency symbol off. Why? It makes it more of an experience rather than a transactional experience. So it changes the experience for somebody. I love it. So we're creating experiences. Yes. As entrepreneurs, so see if you're in the high end area, you're creating experiences, and so you don't want it to be the focus of the dollars, the cents, the nitpicking, right? You want to focus more on the experience. Yeah, I love it. I love it. So prestige pricing, if you want to go high end, and if you want the value shopper, charm pricing dot ninety nine. <laughs> yeah, and if you're selling something like a, a service you know, let's say you're in construction and you're pricing everything down to the dollar, you know, even if it's a big job, I'm not talking about pennies, but like you're pricing everything down, then don't complain when you attract clients who are watching every dollar, because that's what you're communicating to them, that every dollar matters. I love that. This has been some really good juicy nuggets out there from making sure it's easy to buy, putting in the prices versus guessing so that people know where they fit in. If they're the ideal customer, they'll stick around. And then talking their language really is what it comes out. Talking their language. You know, is this a person that is looking to make a 0.99, they need a dollar fifty pair of underwear from Walmart, or is this person, you know, they're here for the experience. And so you know, when you're there for the experience and you're staying at the five-star hotel, right? You don't care if the soda is $1.99 or $2 or $3. You just want the soda. No. And it's tacky then. It would be really tacky if the Crown Plaza put the soda as $4. I mean, if it was expensive and they put it as $4.97 instead of $5, it's, you know, it's kind of insulting to the high-end consumer. Exactly. Who just wants to settle the bill. Yeah. Move like, on. Just, please. And so, Miriam, you have helped thousands of artists sell more art, and you say that the key is not necessarily social media anymore. Social media is not necessarily the way to attract the buyer for the, the artist or even the high end, right? 
that the actual future might be marketing through email. Tell me about this. Tell me about this more because people are now finding they can't do the Facebook ads. It's not targeting the right customer. Tell me about what you're seeing in this. Okay. So when I set out to write the book, I did not put in uh, an emphasis on social media. That was not in my proposal. And when I got my first developmental edits back from HarperCollins, the developmental editor, she was disappointed that I didn't talk more about social media and, and thought, oh, well, she's a woman in her 50s. She must be old fashioned, blah, blah, blah. And when I got that criticism, I realized that meant I didn't create a strong enough case for why the future of marketing is not social media. So after I got those developmental edits back, I didn't put in more information about using social media. I built a stronger case. So when I first started writing the book, the average engagement rate on Instagram was 1% for an average user. So this is profit first. So I know that we have sophisticated people, but if there's a thousand people, 1% is 10 people. Okay. So by the time I went to edit the book, that rate had dropped to 0.6%. So out of a thousand people, six people. And well, what about the influencers? What about all the people teaching us how to get better engagement on social media? They have a slightly better rate. Their average engagement rate for an influencer is 1.18%. In other words, 12 people out of a thousand. Just the odds aren't working in your season. favor then. No. And then part of my book launch strategy, I thought I would do Instagram lives every day. And I've been doing them up until today. And this morning I made the decision to cancel the future ones. I'll tell you why. So when you go on Instagram live, right before you hit that plus on your Instagram app and you choose live, right before you hit record, it will tell you how many of your followers are on the app. I have 25,000 followers. Suzanne, what would you guess would be the number of people who are on the app? Not, Not willing to engage with me, not watching my live, but are just on the app. Probably like billions, right? No, of my followers, of, of my twenty, followers. of my oh. twenty five thousand. I have twenty five thousand followers. So, how many would you guess of those people would be on the At app? One given time. Oh, during work hours or after work hours? <laughs> Any time. I did it all different times. Maybe half. So you would guess like ten thousand. I would say like it would just ring on your your phone, right? Um, if somebody was talking about something interesting, you might be just glancing at it. I I would say half, maybe. Yeah. Well, mo- most most interviews I talk to would guess. Yes, a, a number much bigger than what it is. So the actual number, the biggest number I got was 65 people. <gasps> I know. So if I had every single person say, yes, I want to watch her live, like maybe it'd be worth it. So I had I had IG lives with like 10 people watching because there were only 65 people on the app. They're not on there. Wow. So are you better off uploading a video then versus doing it live? Well, this is what I call the death of the scroll. So both Reels and TikTok operate in the same way. If you've ever consumed this content, that even before you get to the end of the video, it's the swipe up, the scroll. Like you Mm -hmm. don't stop to engage. And you'll see this in TikTok. Like they'll say that um, someone on TikTok can have millions of followers, but nobody even knows who they are because you can follow someone on TikTok and never see their content ever again. Mm -hmm. I think that's why it's very smart you're investing in YouTube. YouTube is a lot different. Oh, yeah. Every time your favorite person comes up, you know, it, it pops. I'm like, I'm in a meeting right now, and, and I'm glad you've just posted your video live. Somehow Google has broken all social media etiquette rules. That's right. Well, that's that's why when Apple was changing the privacy policies, you you noticed how Google was didn't say a word, like they didn't care. They're like, no, we got this. <laughs> we're gonna do. What we're gonna do. So tell me about so social media not working. Tell me about email then. Tell me about why is email better and more effective. Okay. We're using the example, a thousand people. And if you are not an influencer, only six people are going to, let's even say you're an influencer. We're all hot. Okay. So 12 people are going to see it. 
if you sent that same thing out to your email list and you have a thousand people, the average open rate is 25%. That means 250 people will see your marketing message. But here's the big difference, Suzanne. On Instagram, well, first of all, we know not people aren't even on the platform, but in email, in your inbox, the person I send the email to, they get to decide if they open it. On Instagram, the algorithm decides if they even see it. Wow. So that's why the future of marketing is email. And we've here, um, and so in my book, I've quoted everyone from Ryan Dice to uh, Marie Forleo, and they're both saying the same thing. The future of marketing is email. I love it. I love it. Well, that's going to be a lot less expensive than than Facebook ads um, and that sort of thing, you know. So I'm I'm actually kind of happy it's moving towards email. We just need to work on our copy now, right? Which is really great. So tell me about, you know, what are the five most common mistakes that people make when they're creating and eventually selling their arts products or services? Okay, so. In, in Artpreneur, I go through the five um, parts, and this is true not just of artists. This is true of any business. doesn't matter if you're selling sneakers, um, if you're a restaurant, whatever. You have production. What are you producing? Pricing. How are you pricing it at? Uh, prospecting. How are you finding your leads? Promotion and productivity. So there's basically a mistake in each one of them. And usually what the problem is, is people misidentify what the problem is. Mm -hmm. So I'll hear artists say to me all the time, oh, if only um, I had a bigger audience, I would sell more. And I was like, no, that's not the problem because look at what we just talked about. It's not about the bigger audience. A lot of times with that, there it's not a promotion problem or prospecting problem, they actually have a pricing problem because they're pricing their their things too low. So I'll see people who, I like to call it the painted rock problem. You know, they're trying to sell something that just can't be priced higher, like a greeting card. So when you're working on volume instead of a premium good, you do need a lot of people, but oftentimes they have a either a production problem, they're pricing, they're selling the wrong thing so like a painted rock that can't be priced higher, or um, they have something like a greeting card that requires a lot of volume to sell it. So it's usually they've misidentified the problem. And a lot of it comes down to picking the wrong product that can't be priced higher. Or when if you have pricing drama where you believe, so picking the wrong product would be mistake one. Number two, if you believe cheaper is easier to sell and you underprice yourself, then you will come into these other problems because you'll try to make up with your low prices with volume. And that almost never works. I mean, even Walmart is getting unseated now. Like it, that's a race to the bottom. Yeah. I just imagine just the cost of acquisition. I mean, especially if you're using advertisements that are more traditional, like your Facebook ads, you know, I mean, the cost per lead, just because you get a lead doesn't mean it's a sell, right? That's right. Um, you may close maybe 10% of the leads that actually show up. And sometimes you're talking about almost $2,000 a lead, depending on what type of product or service that you're offering. And so, you know, just like the, the cost of acquisition might not justify a cost or um, the price that you're offering at, depending on what you're selling. And then we can get into um, other problems I see. So um, promotion, sometimes people are conflating marketing with sales. You see that a lot on social media. Like, you know, the marketing is really should just be to get the attention. And then the selling is what happens after you've gotten their attention. You don't do it all at the same time. I mean, there's very few industries who can do that. Definitely. I can see that. I mean, marketing is just about making sure that people know who you are and what you're doing, right? Yeah. And then the sales is the conversation from the marketing, from that interest. So that would be um, a third mistake. A fourth mistake is using social media for sales instead of being social. So the brands that are going to be succeeding in 2023 are using social media now for engagement rather than audience building. So, because of all the things that we talked about, although that is, there's, there's some I problems, but there too, I don't know. And only 65 people are showing up. 
That's interesting that you talk about that. Cause I think one of the things that happened during the pandemic, and, and I think all of you guys will probably have experienced this type of abuse. Didn't somebody reach out to you on the DM through like messenger to sell you something? And they just cut straight to the point. Who's your insurance provider? Who's doing your health insurance? I can do that for you. And it's almost like directly trying to sell through the DMs. So tell me about with that, um, you know, we talked about increasing engagement versus trying to um, build following. What does that mean in the marketing world on social? Okay. So I'm glad you brought up the DMs. So I do talk about that in Artpreneur, that the person who tries to sell you with a three paragraph DM Um, you know, usually sent by their assistant. It's like walking into a department store and getting sprayed with perfume. Isn't it? I mean, you you feel ill afterwards after like all three of them spray you at the same time. Exactly. Right. That's exactly what it feels like. You know, you're being attacked as soon as you walk in. It's like, no, don't, you know, that's been the nice thing about the pandemic, a little spit of that distancing when I go shopping now. So I do use DMs. Um, I think that is the best place to really engage with your customers. And you need to be a human in there. Some of that can be automated, but I like to personally welcome people who start following me. How did you find me? It's a great way to drop in a credibility marker. So what I say is, hey, I'm Miriam Shulman. I help artists build their businesses. And then I'll say, did you find me because of... Usually I say the Inspiration Place podcast, but if I had some really great publicity, like when I was in entrepreneur.com, I asked that, but it's like kind of a way to drop in a credibility marker and start the conversation. If they say yes, I move on to the next question. If they say no, I let them know I have a podcast. So now we started turning somebody who just decided to follow me. We don't know why into somebody who maybe is going to engage with me and more importantly, engage with my content. I love that. I love that idea of reaching back and saying, Hey, um, how did you find me? Or because listen, usually when people connect with you, you, you kind of leave it there. You know, it's just, they connect in like, you're going to ask me something. Or if they ask you, it's like, Hey, can you go buy my insurance? <laughs> but you know, but the fact that you reach back out and said, Hey, I'm, I'm curious. You started a conversation, right? You started a relationship where you didn't have any expectations for this person. And suddenly you have a friend online when you pop up there. So that's a really great idea. Well, you can't sell to somebody if they don't even know who you are yet. And that is something that I outlined in the chapter about selling, which I called listen to understand. So the steps are now when you, when you walk into a store, Unfortunately, social skills have just gone by the wayside, but for some chains where they really do train the salespeople and you walk in, they ask you their, your name, they put your name on like the little chalkboard in the back of the dressing room. Um, you know, that's fairly nice. And when I go into a sales situation and they don't ask me my name and they don't introduce themselves, I mean, that's step one of selling is introduce yourself, whether you're in person or online. I love that. And again, it's just going back to that high ticket versus low ticket charm versus prestige. When you're dealing with a more prestigious type of sell, it is relationship. It's about, hey, you belong in this room and and I want you to feel comfortable with that. Yes. And I just a little tip that has nothing to do with being on the sales side, but even as a consumer, I found I get way better service. They may not introduce themselves. I do it for them. Hey, I'm Miriam. What's your name? And I was in like a makeup store the other day and she said, I'm Stacy. And you could see how happy she was that somebody was treating her like a human and asking her who she was. So whether I'm in a store or at a restaurant, I always make sure I know who the server is and what their name is because um, it makes them feel good, which is a great thing, but I also get better service. You know, it kind of goes back to our conversation earlier. We were talking about, you know, B Corps and and people buying based upon values And I think one of the things that has happened in the pandemic is with the social isolation, you know, they've lost that feeling of belonging, community, hello, being seen. People are craving that individual attention. See me, hear me, know me, right? And when you do that, even if they came in looking for a $1.99 pair of underwear at Walmart, you know, the fact that you said my name, you acknowledged me, you looked me in the eye. Suddenly I might buy that $400 bong you're talking about, right? I don't think Walmart sells it, but you know, you probably have the- Oh no, I no, no. This other you've, got a, you've got a Bergdorf Goodman, maybe you'll find it. 
<laughs> exactly. And and I'm curious because, you know, Bernard Gorman, they are known for not putting the prices on their goods when you go into their New York store. Um, I wonder, I'm just curious what your take is on that. <laughs> Yeah, I haven't seen that they don't have, I guess I did go to the boutique where the prices weren't there. I've always seen prices on their stuff. You'll see it's always rounded, always rounded prices. Like it's the plate is $180, not whatever, not $178. It's not some weird number. Shawl that I like there. And I was like petting the shawl like it was like a mink coat or like a animal, furry animal. And I was looking for the price and I couldn't find it. I was too embarrassed to ask. Maybe they could have had the sale if, they had, if I had known you know, what the price was. I really don't like when I go into stores and there's no prices. So that's going back to transparency. You're not doing anybody a favor because not everyone wants to ask because they don't want to be embarrassed. And you want to put your customer's comfort first. Not embarrassing them should be one of your goals. Exactly. I don't want to ask, do you have layaway, you know, for this car? <laughs> Let me save face. Just put the price on there so I know if I need to proceed or not on there. But I absolutely agree. But yeah, they're notorious for not putting the price on there. Um, you know, some things I'll have it, but very few things um, is what how it is. I'm just curious what your take is on there. And, um, you know, this has been an amazing conversation, Mary. There's so many juicy Ted bets. I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to like dig more into your book. But one thing we like to ask our guests is if you could leave our viewers, our listeners, well, one piece of advice it could be personal, or it could be business. What would that advice be? Yes. So right now there's so much talk right now about chat GPT and artificial intelligence. And I know you have mentioned you have a lot of lawyers who listen to it and how like this could take over the world. And as a creative person, I'm not worried about it because I know that what people want is they want to, like I said, they want to shop with their values. They want a connection. They want some a brand that has personality. So if you want to succeed in 2023 and beyond, lead with your inspiration and your personality, all the things that a robot can't do. I love it. I love it. You know, so many people are worried about um, the AI out there and how it's replacing jobs, but you're absolutely right. It can't replace you. No. And ChatGPT, they couldn't even tell you if a hamburger is better than a hot dog because it doesn't have an opinion. It can give you facts, but not an opinion. And that's what people are looking for. They want to know your point of view. I love it. I love it. Very, very great advice there is that's not something you have to worry about, right? You, you have to stand in the you. Now, Miriam, how do we find out more about you? How do we learn more? I know you're about to drop this amazing book. I'm like looking at the copies and I'm salivating in behind you. Um, how do we get a copy of that? How do we find you? Okay. So art, it's I know because I know we're on YouTube. So <laughs> artpreneur, it is available in the stores because it's by Harper Collins. Um, if you head over to artpreneurbook.com, I've listed all the different places that you can order it from. So if you are international and you need free shipping, we have that available for you as well. Bookdepository.com. We have a ton of bonuses that you're going to love. Uh, lots of free coaching from branding experts and copywriting experts. So worth way more than the price of the book. If you want to try the book out though, before you buy it, I would love to give you a free chapter. Just go to shulmanart.com forward slash believe. Okay. The guys that are driving right now, stay safe, stay safe. Don't, don't stop That's to right. write this down. I will drop this in the show notes. You can just click and get this amazingness and amazing coaching. Cause you know, what you guys heard today was just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. So again, shulmanart.com forward slash believe, and we'll send you chapter one, which is choose to believe. And if you do decide to get the book, you will get all 14 abundant artist lessons. Amazing. Amazing. So um, lots of goodness. You guys definitely want to get your book. It's coming out January 31st. So you want to get that copy of that book um, because we're all artists, right? We're all artists and this is our craft. This is the craft that we were given. And there's a lot of GC lessons and honing in that craft and, and making a respectable living, right? Making a respectable living for the passion, the time and the life you're dedicating to it. Thank you so much, Miriam, for joining us today and just sharing your juicy bits of wisdom that has been so helpful for us. 
Well, thanks, Suzanne, for having me. Thank you, Miriam.